Molly, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. I'm really grateful that you're joining us today. Thank you for having me. Molly, your accent tells us that you are not from the United States. You're joining us from across the pond. Where are you from? I am originally from Derby in England, but now I live in Kent. Excellent. I love technology that it can connect us in such vast spaces. So, Molly, you are a wonder at your age and what you've accomplished. It's really phenomenal and such an inspiration. Tell us a little bit about what you do. So I um, I am a filmmaker and I predominantly make films that kind of surround youth issues. Um, and a lot of my films so far have been used in kind of schools and colleges as as like an educational resource. And I've been very lucky to be able to kind of go into um, schools with my films and kind of do workshops and talks and everything like that. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, the things that the youth these days are struggling with, I mean, they've always been around, but I think they're so much more magnified and pronounced these days. And then COVID really kind of put a nice little spin on all of it mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> Tell us a little more about what got you to this point and how you're now doing what you do. So I was acting uh, for a few years. So that kind of gave me an insight into the the film industry and everything. And it was through kind of meeting other actors and everything like that and it kind of it was almost like a stepping stone for me um because I'd never really considered uh, the prospect of being behind the camera I'd always kind of wanted to do acting um and then it was I had had a bad experience at school and I realized how alone I felt during that time and I realized I never wanted anyone else to to feel alone in what they were going through so I thought if I can kind of visualize things in the sense of they they can have a visual representation of okay someone else understands and someone else gets it and everything then that was something that I really really wanted to do so I kind of combined the two um and I made my first film in 2019 I think and you were how old 18 that's amazing making your first film at 18 years old and don't do the math folks just leave it as it is <laughs> oh no I was I, I'm 18 now and then I was 15 I think 15 or 16 I think 15 when I made my first one all right 18 years <laughs> old today with several films under your belt you're a speaker you visit colleges uh, other schools and other places to talk about your experiences congratulations Thanks. on the success and I can see, um, for those that are listening to the podcast, jump on YouTube later and just look at the passion and the the life in Molly's expression. She loves doing what she does. It's apparent. Um, Molly, when I jump on your website, and that link is in the show notes if anybody wants to check it out, I went to the Films and Trailers tab. And, oh, the ones that you have highlighted there are so compelling uh, for the love of Eve. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? So for the love of Eve is my most recent film and that, is, that covers the issue with um, county lines and, and drug dealing. Um, and it's kind of, that's, that's the main theme that runs throughout it. But I think it's also about kind of what we're willing to do for the people that we love and, and how, because I think with with issues like county lines and with issues like drug abuse and everything like that, I think it can become such a like a almost like people aren't human anymore. Almost like it's just a statistic or it's just kind of seen as an issue rather than the actual people involved. And I kind of wanted to to highlight because when I was, I've always wanted to do something on that topic, 
when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, I'd never get involved in anything like that. But then I thought, okay, if my, because I have a younger sister, I thought if she came to me and she said, you know, you need to do this for me or something's going to happen or something, I wouldn't think twice. I'd just do it. So I think that that's what I wanted to show in the film, kind of how, even though you could easily say, I'd never do that. And you could judge other people for getting involved in that. If you were in that situation, you never, ever know kind of what, what decisions you will make. Um, so hopefully that kind of was portrayed in the film that kind of anyone can get involved and how dangerous it can get so quickly. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody wakes up in a good life and says, hey, I think I'll be a drug dealer. <laughs> I think I'm going to go hang out in these dangerous situations, mm -hmm. make a little extra cash, doing a little drugs, selling some. It's a series of life experiences that gets us to these points. And when we're desperate, we make desperate decisions. Definitely. And I think you portray that so well in what you do that it's not that we say this is who we're going to be, but the desperation kind of guides us to these places. And before we know it, we're in a place we never thought we would be. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So what's in your backstory that got you to this place of wanting to share this? So it was, I, I was bullied at school um, and that was kind of, I'd always had kind of mental health issues, like kind of anxiety and depression and everything from a very, very young age. Um, and that kind of, that got worse when I was at school um, because of, of the bullying that was happening and everything. It was never physical. It was never anything like that. But it was a lot of kind of, a lot of name calling, a lot of kind of rumours and everything like that. And kind of things that, that looking back might not have, have been catastrophic but at the time when you're in it it feels so terrible to know that like everyone's talking about you and there's kind of group chats being made about you and everything like that and I think social media probably amplified that um like there were a lot of accounts made about me and everything and and comments posted online um yeah so that kind of that sent me down kind of a, a dark tunnel in a way. Um, and I was very, I was very, very suicidal at that point. And I was kind of, I was about 13, 14. So kind of from the ages of about 12 to 14, I can barely remember anything because I was so, so like depressed that I think my brain has just kind of blocked it out. So I can only remember kind of certain things. Um, but yeah, that, that was definitely made worse. And it's still something that I kind of struggle with now it's not as bad but it's still something where I have kind of like my my down days and everything and I think that's just kind of the way that I am and that's the way that I'll always be but yeah it was definitely made worse by by those at school and the situation that I was in um and it was even though I had kind of amazing parents and really supportive family and everything I knew how lucky I was to have that and I knew that not everyone had that so I I, I mean without my parents I would there is no way that I'd be here. So it's kind of because I felt so alone in what was happening. That was kind of the the initial drive for me, thinking, okay, if if I didn't have the parents that I did, then I would have done something and I wouldn't be here anymore. So so if I can kind of make people feel less alone in what they're going through, then that's that's the goal. What was the turning point for you? Most people hit a rock bottom, but there's something that happens that flips a switch or changes the direction. What was that changing point for you? It was, um, I think initially it was, not many people know this actually, but it was, I, um, I got to a point where I nearly attempted to kill myself. And it was kind of the closest that I'd ever been. And it was, and just as I was about to do it, something in my head said, you've got more to do and, and you've got more of a purpose. And that kind of, that hit me. I mean, it didn't take everything away. I'm still depressed. I'm still anxious. I was still getting bullied. You know, everything was still happening. But that was kind of like a, it just kind of stopped me for that second. And I thought, okay, what if I do have more to do? And I do. And it is, I mean, I'm very, very grateful that that kind of happened and everything. So, 
so that I didn't do anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think that was that was the first moment, and then the second moment for me was um, after leaving school. I enrolled on a college course that was for people who were like me, who had either been bullied or had kind of care and responsibilities or loads of different things, um, like 14, 16 year olds. And it was obviously my parents had always been wonderful and they'd always backed my films and everything like that. Um, but it was, I was just about to do a premiere and one of my teachers, um, she, she like played my films and everything in front of all of the students. And that kind of like, solidified it for me and if that it started there where I was told you've got more to do and then it was in that moment that I was like okay this is what this is what that voice in my head meant when it said I've got more to do so yeah I'm very grateful for her to that I cried to her afterwards about it <laughs> yeah and she really helped put some form and structure into into that dream I think a lot of adults can't identify with what it's like being cyberbullied. Because when we were in school, once we left, it turned off. Mm -hmm. uh, if we didn't want to experience the bullying, we just didn't go to the places where the people were. And that had its own problems, of course, you know, withdraw and whatnot. But to have that 24-7 with no way to shut it off, even if you don't look at the internet, it's out there and everybody else is participating in it. And when you're that age, you don't have the perspective of what life can be like beyond school. Yeah. So your world is still growing and it's still in its small stages. And the school life and those friends that you have encompass all of life that you know. And with uh, so much negativity coming from that space, I can't imagine how debilitating that would be. Yeah, it, it was it was difficult because there was no there was no kind of respite from it. I mean, you know, I could have logged out of social media and I could have shut my phone off, but it's like you said, it's still there, and other people can still see it. So then I get paranoid and everything, and I still kind of, I mean, I've had it since I've had kind of trolls on Twitter and everything but it hasn't been as bad because they didn't know me so it didn't seem as like personal um but yeah it, still even now and then I'll kind of I'll get a notification that I've got a comment on something or a message and something and my stomach will go a little bit and I'll think oh god um but yeah luckily it's it's fine but I still kind of get that feeling every now and then but I think it's just it was it was frustrating more than anything because obviously school, I was choosing to go to school and that was kind of a choice that I had made. But then I'd, I'd almost get angry at the fact that they were like infiltrating my house as well and kind of at me at, at every single second of every single day. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's so difficult because that's something that I've kind of found with adults I spoke to who have been bullied in the past that for them it was it was done when they left school and and everything like that but, but yeah it's kind of social media can be amazing and it can be a really really good tool to kind of meet people and everything but it can also be so difficult because you are there constantly you're accessible constantly so yeah what was your first film what was that one that the teacher showed in class that put form to your dream? That was um, that was Trauma Jack, and that was about knife crime um, and about kind of the the kind of knock on effect that that can have. Um, but yeah, that was that was the first one, and that was kind of a whirlwind four days filming. But it kind of it it solidified it as I was filming it. I was like, this is my life now. This is what I want to do, like, forever. <laughs> and that's also on the website. So if you want to <laughs> see her first work, if you want to see that seminal moment, this is it that's available there. Uh, you also have a, a story called Brooke. Uh, <laughs> she navigates being bullied. How much of that is an autobiography? Pretty much all of it is kind of, based off of um what happened there's a few things that I've kind of changed because to be honest a lot of it 
a lot of what was said to me was too graphic to be put in a film to show his kids. So I kind of, I dialed it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, but, but a lot of it was kind of, and I used the comments as well that, that people kind of sent to me and everything like that. Um, but then kind of tried to make it as PG as I could. Yeah. And then there are other films on there. Uh, Zoe is one. She struggles in a toxic relationship. And I applaud you for your work in that one, too. Thank you. Those are phenomenal products that you're producing that's really going to speak to kids. Thank you. So as a filmmaker, from your first one to your most current one, what have you learned and how have you grown in your craft? I think I've learned to not put so much pressure on myself. I think I think that that's kind of the the main thing, um, and kind of because it can when you're kind of organising filming dates and everything, it can get stressful sometimes, and and you do get a lot of comments and you get a lot of messages and everything from people who don't like what you're doing and and everything. And that can be quite difficult because obviously you can be so passionate about an idea. And then it's almost like it gets tainted by by the way that other people feel towards it. Um, but yeah, I think it's just kind of having an idea and going with it and not caring so much about kind of whether it's the best film in the world or whatever. If it, if it, if it gets the issue across and if it helps anyone, then kind of I feel like I've fulfilled what I need to do with it. Um, but yeah, and kind of not not kind of burn myself out I think (laughs) so when you go and speak somewhere do you have kids that come up to you afterwards and share their stories with you I had um Mm. I did an assembly for year seven something that kind of 11 12 year old I think um and I had someone find me on social media afterwards kind of that night after I'd done it um, and she messaged me and she said that she had been, because we showed Brooke and everything, and she had been being bullied and everything. And then to see a film and to see me now, kind of after everything had happened, because in my talk, I kind of explained what happened to me and everything. Um, and she said to kind of see me now, kind of gave her that knowledge that you can kind of get out of it and, and you can be okay and everything. So that. I mean, that definitely made me cry because that was, I mean, it was, it was just wonderful to kind of have someone go out of their way to not only message me, but to find me and everything and remember my name to, to send me a message. But yeah, it was, it was really, really wonderful to receive that. What do you imagine yourself doing in 30 years? I think I'll. I think I'll still be making films, possibly not about youth issues. So I think uh, I think I'll reach a point where I'm not, where I can't talk on behalf of youth anymore. I think once I get past a certain age, then that's that's me done. But I'd really like to kind of almost pass that on to another young filmmaker. So so there's like a constant stream of, of youth talking for youth. Um, but yeah, kind of still making films and and plodding along and and meeting people and everything and hopefully kind of teaching acting and filmmaking and everything like that because that's something that I love to do um but yeah kind of still doing films and everything (laughs) yeah do you envision yourself being a mentor as you pass this baton to others I hope so I I I really, really hope so because there were a lot of young directors that helped me um, when I was first starting and everything that kind of dealt with a lot of questions from me and a lot of kind of panicked messages of, <laughs> oh my God, I've just deleted footage. What do I do? Kind of because there were a lot of, I, there's been a lot of errors and there's been a lot of mistakes that I've made that I've kind of learned from. Um, now I've kind of, I've learned as I've gone. Um, but yeah, to be able to kind of do that the the next generation that that's something that I'm really really passionate about doing hopefully (laughs) yeah I can't wait to see the Molly and oh forgive me is it levers Mm -hmm. 
Molly Lever School of Filmmaking someday. How fun would that be? I love it. It would be a dream, that would. At this point in your young life, what can you imagine would be the biggest accolade that you could receive? I think most recently I've been shortlisted for a um, an award, the Shark Awards, um, and that's the, a script that I wrote. And that kind of, I mean, I still can't get over that, really. I'm still kind of a bit like, are you sure? But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I mean, I've got no words about that, really, but, but kind of receiving something like that and, and being shortlisted for something like that and it being judged by kind of creative director of Ridley Scott's production company and everything. It's just like, oh my gosh, like these are, either industry professionals and yeah. and everything and the fact that they have read something and taken the time to to read something that I've written and have liked it is still kind of I can't I can't work out. Well and there are a lot of different talents and aspects of filmmaking. There's the script, uh the the angles you choose to film in, the lighting the the soundtrack, all of those things, finding the right person, the casting. Is there an aspect of this process that you like more than others? Do you enjoy all of it? I think I think I enjoy the actual physical filming of it the most because um I mean I love the writing side of it. I love to be able to kind of that that first step of getting an idea out there and everything that's always so exciting because you don't know where it's going to lead or what's going to happen or anything but I I really really enjoy kind of the actual filming filming because it's always so fun like even though we're filming about really serious topics and everything like in my first film when we were filming a, a scene where one of the characters is stabbed like which is a really gritty emotional scene and everything like behind the scenes we we're all laughing about different vans going past and everything so it's it's just kind of you seriously make friends for life when you're filming it's like you've got each film for me it's like a, a second and third and fourth family and everything it sounds amazing now for the teenager or tween that's listening to this podcast or overhearing someone else listening to this podcast or who finds it on YouTube, what message would you like that person struggling to hear? You are never, ever on your own. Even if you're kind of in a situation where you can't talk to your family or anything like that, there is always someone out there who will listen, who will help you and who will be able to kind of put you in the right direction and you honestly never know what's around the corner ever it can be the things can feel so bleak and they it can feel like kind of life isn't moving forward and then suddenly something will happen and that might take a day or it might take a year or but just kind of just keep waiting because you never know and you don't have to live you don't have to live well you just have to survive and then you'll find the that as more time goes on that you find yourself living more. That's beautiful. And let's flip, flip the script for a moment, if you will. What would you say to the person who might be in a position to hear this plea from, from a teen that feels alone? What would you want that person in that position to know for when that person comes to them? I think it's knowing, don't put too much pressure on yourself because a lot of the time people just need someone to talk to and they don't necessarily meet, need you to have all of the answers, but, but just knowing that someone cares and knowing that they're trying and everything, you don't have to fix it for them. And I know that that's kind of a natural reaction to have that you want to kind of fix people's problems when they're sad, but just kind of being there and and just having someone come to you and, and talk about what they're going through, that's possibly all that they need and you can help as much as you can and everything, but don't put too much pressure on yourself to to kind of fix everything and look after yourself as well because I think that it can be quite difficult when someone 
is talking to you about something like that. So make sure that you kind of don't take it on too much where it kind of affects you. Molly Leavers, with a vision and a wisdom beyond your years, remember this name, folks, because she is going to leave a mark in this world, and it's going to be a good one. Molly, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.